Good morning. My name is Jessica Zufolo, and I'm the moderator for uh, this morning's event. I'd like to welcome you all to the Congressional Internet Caucus Foundation's panel discussion on port blocking, which I expect will be pretty informative and pretty relevant to the larger debate currently going on in Congress over how to reform the Telecom Act. Um, by way of introduction um, on me, um, I'm a telecom equity analyst for Medley Global Advisors, which is an independent research advisory firm that provides regulatory and political analysis to institutional investors. And as a disclaimer, Medley Advisors holds no investments in any telecom stocks, and neither do I personally. So I just wanted to, for house, house, housekeeping, wanted to put that out there. Um, Today's discussion will focus on the issue of port blocking offered by unaffiliated ISPs, I'm sorry, I, I, ISPs and IP-based um, telephony providers, and whether this matter is a legitimate barrier to entry that requires regulatory intervention, or whether, as the title of, the, of this morning's um, panel um, discussion states, is merely a benign fluke that has a low probability of recurring in the future. Um, before we get started, I want to just uh, first take a minute to thank the Congressional Internet Caucus co-chairs, Congressman Rick Boucher um, from the western part of Virginia and Congressman Goodlatte from the southern part of Virginia for their willingness to host this panel discussion today and for their continued leadership in the area of Internet policy. I know both Judiciary and Commerce Committees um, this week, um, of which our two co-chairs serve, are having pretty high-profile hearings on the issue of IP issues um, and also the recent telco mergers. So for the staff in the audience who are able to participate with us today, I just want to thank you for making the time to come in and listen to this um, pretty interesting panel. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping um, in terms of um, Internet Caucus events for the future. The next um, caucus event is Thursday, April 28th um, at noon in the Mansfield Room, which is um, in the Capitol building upstairs. And the title is um, The Patent Process in the Internet Age, Time for Reform. Um, the folks that are moderating are James Rogan, former congressman um, and former undersecretary of commerce for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And some of the panelists include um, Nathan Mervahold, co-founder of Intellectual Ventures and former Microsoft Chief Technology Officer, and Danny Weitzner. I think I might have um, butchered his name, um, with World Wide Web Consortium. Okay, so today's panel, panelists are as follows. Um, we have Jefferson Tron. Chairman and CEO of Vonage Holdings Corporation. Previously, Mr. Citron was the founder and CEO of Daytech Online Holdings, an online brokerage company that later became Ameritrade. Next to him is Dan Brunner um, from the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, who serves there as their senior vice president for law and regulatory policy. Previously, Dan served as director of communications law and a member of the faculty for UCLA Law School. Uh, next to him is James Spada, Associate Professor at Northwestern Law, who previously clerked for Judge Harry Edwards with the D.C. Circuit, and before that um, practiced at Sidley and Austin in Chicago. And finally, Tim Wu, Associate Professor at the University of Virginia Law School. Um, previously, um, Tim clerked for Judge um, Richard Posner from the Seventh Circuit, and before that, Judge Stephen Breyer from the Supreme Court. So I think we have a great panel. And I'm really um, grateful to be here, so I want to thank the Internet Caucus for inviting me. To start off our discussion, I'd like to provide just a brief overview on all the issues that we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, and to start, I just want to give a little bit of a pretty brief overview of kind of the issue of port blocking and some of the issues that I think um, are pretty weigh weighing pretty heavily on, on the minds of policymakers, both on the Hill and at the FCC, and for those of us in the investment community as well. At the beginning of the year, Vonage filed a complaint with the FCC asserting that its customers were being blocked. And in March, Vonage, filed, Vonage prevailed, and the FCC issued a consent decree um, to a local exchange carrier, Madison River Communications, which is an incumbent LEC that operates in North Carolina. The consent decree required Madison River to refrain from blocking Vonage's VOIP traffic. And this consent decree um, expires in about 30 months. I think it's really important to note for this debate that um, the FCC's enforcement action in this area applied to a common carrier, namely Madison River. 
which is currently regulated by the FCC under Title II of the Communications Act. The consent decree was issued under the FCC's Section 201 authority, which is premised on the notion that the offending carrier is a common carrier. Traditionally, wireline common carriers like the Bells and other incumbent LECs are regulated under Title II, which incorporates a specific set of rules authorizing the FCC to ensure that incumbent networks remain open to competitive entrants while also complying with a number of social goals, namely universal service, the provision of emergency access to 911 capabilities, CALEA, mandatory minimum service quality standards, just to name a few. I also want to outline here for clarification purposes the definition of an information service under the Telecom Act, um, which is, and I'm sure you all know, because I know we have a lot of experts in the room, the offering of a capability for generating, acquiring, storing, transforming, processing, retrieving, utilizing, or making available information via telecommunications. The FCC has stated that under the Act, telecommunications providers are subject to common carrier duties, whereas providers of information services are not. Therefore, cable modem services are currently regulated by the FCC as information services under Title I of the Act, which includes none of the requirements I just mentioned under Title II that um, are synonymous with common carrier telecommunications providers. In addition, cable video services are regulated separately under Title VI of the Act, which pertain mainly to video services offered by cable MSOs. So for several years now, the Bell companies have been urging policymakers to regulate their high-speed service in the exact same manner as cable providers. The argument is that like services should be regulated in a like manner in order and mostly to be free from network sharing rules in addition. And as all of you know, um, the, uh, the FCC was successful earlier this year in eliminating, eliminating those network sharing rules on the narrowband side. The Bells recently have filed numerous petitions, maybe not so recently, have filed numerous petitions seeking to be classified as information service providers under the Commission's broad Title I authority. And many of these petitions are coming up soon. However, the FCC may end up addressing them, um, and this is my personal view, um, I think this is maybe what they'll do, um, may address these petitions after the Supreme Court issues its ruling in the Brand X case which will determine whether the FCC's rules declaring cable modem services and information service as information services are sustained. And then if you want, we can talk about the Brand X case, although I think everybody in this audience probably is pretty well versed in, in, in what that case is and is not about. So there's no question that this case, namely Brand X, depending on which way the court goes, will heavily influence the debate over the appropriate regulatory framework for IP services both on the Hill and at the FCC. The tenor on the Hill and at the FCC, particularly under Chairman Martin, appear to be in favor of establishing a regulatory, establishing regulatory parity between cable modem and DSL services. And as everybody knows, this debate has been going on for a long time. In addition, the FCC has been also holding in abeyance a couple of other broadband proceedings pending the outcome of the Brand X case before the Supreme Court. So for independent VOIP providers like Vonage, um, the Brand X case I think is pretty important. As we discuss the issue of whether port blocking is an isolated incident or a growing trend, I think we need to examine what remedies are appropriate for addressing these types of behaviors and what policymakers on the Hill and at the FCC need to do to promote greater efficiencies in the market, particularly in the area of internet telephony. And as most, as, and as we were seeing, you know, trends in the market obviously indicate that the majority of traffic is moving towards an IP-based model. In addition, I would like to add that this issue recently has been elevated in the merger context. As many of us who follow the discussions in the House and the Senate have noted, recently some of the concerns on this issue have expressed over whether any form of packet prioritization would occur once the nation's vast internet backbone facilities, which are currently owned by AT&T and MCI, one day could be managed by incumbent providers. 
I'm looking forward to having our panel talk a little bit about these issues, um, and in particular, kind of what they think, how this issue should fit into the larger discussion over uh, the Telecom Act, whether to reform it, how the FCC should address these matters, and in addition, what um, policymakers both at the state and federal level should do in the merger context, and whether this issue is a legitimate one. So um, we're gonna turn to the panel. Um, each panelist has about five minutes to kind of talk very generally and briefly, and, and then we're gonna go into a question and answer session. I'm really encouraged that a lot of people are here because I think we can have a, a very useful and productive interactive debate and discussion with the audience, and I really don't want anyone to be shy in, a, in asking any questions because I think this is a really important discussion. It touches on a lot of stuff. So to start off with, I'd like each, uh, well anyway, I've got some questions, but I'm gonna let, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mr. Citron for five minutes and then we're gonna go down the list. Go for it. Thank you. Well, I'll try and keep my remarks very brief because I'm more interested in the interactive dialogue portion. Um, but I do wanna state that this issue is a very complex and, and pressing issue. Uh, for us, we see that so many people are focused in on the definitions of what kind of service are you and what you do. Am I a service regulated under Title II? Am I regulated under Title I? What does regulatory parity mean? What's the outcome of Brand X? How is that going to affect the marketplace? How does the marketplace resolve those particular issues? I think we're asking all the wrong questions. The right question to ask is what are the fundamental rights of a user to use broadband? It's a very simple question. It doesn't matter what we call it because at the end of the day, we're gonna unify some set of rules around some set of rights. And which of those rights be? Should a consumer have the right to expect a certain amount of privacy when using their broadband? I think the answer should be yes. But today, depending on the regulatory definition, the answer is well, maybe. Today on the Title I, your emails can be read by your provider. Nothing stops that from happening today. I think we need to fix that. Consumers should have the right to attach uh, equipment to the network that makes sense for them. I think that'd be something else would be very important. Consumers should have the right to choose what kind of applications they want to run, what kind of content that they want to go, go ahead and download. Of course, so long as that content should be legal. Um, these are the more, more important issues. And most importantly, if a customer wants to go out and use a particular service over the internet, they should be allowed to do so. That people should not uh, interfere, disrupt, or block those communications. Now, of course, the issues get more complicated when we talk about the prioritization of certain services or the deprioritization of other services. In a sense, if you prioritize everything up, you essentially are leaving some other service behind. And people always focus on this debate, again, about what the network operator wants to do. The network operator is the one that's got the most information. The network operator should be the one that allocates its bandwidth. And we disagree again. It's the consumer who purchases that bandwidth that should be allowed to allocate what resources they want. The consumer should be able to decide whether they want to allocate X amount of bandwidth for their phone service and X amount of, of, of bandwidth for their video service. Today, most common equipment that people install to use broadband services have the ability to prioritize traffic with inside their own network. We should be more focused on protecting consumers and empowering consumers, not taking away those protections and empowering network operators to control how you use your broadband service, what you use it for, and when you can actually go out and, uh, and use it. Thank you. Dan? Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, this, I, I don't know if we were supposed to answer the question, foreboding, harbinger, or benign fluke. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> I thought those were names of two rock bands that didn't make the Lollapalooza <laughs> cut. They would be pretty good names. I probably am, I, 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 I'm more in the category, though, of fluke. I'm not sure anything is benign if, 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 it, if it upsets a business a reasonable business expectation, but um, you know, if, just just to step back for a moment on this whole debate, there you know have been tens of billions, perhaps hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of internet transactions since broadband was introduced by the cable industry, and uh, then DSL uh, followed on with with its product to catch up with cable, and the number of instances of bl blocking are, you know, you can count on. Uh, one or two hands in terms of, of offenders. So by and large, if you look at, at the robustness of the internet today, that it's working, that you can go where you want, purchase what you want, see what you want, communicate with whomever you want, it's a phenomenal success. And we should not lose sight of that as we, as we begin to evaluate uh, this topic. And uh, I think in many ways, uh, the swiftness of the Commission's action in this instance the ability to get a consent decree within a matter of, of tens of hours, not tens of days or tens of weeks, indicates that if there are flukes of this nature, 
uh, which are significant and where you have an incumbent LEC who's been living off the rate of return formula for decades uh, behaving in the way that this one did. The Commission seems to do a terrific job, a, a, a job with great celerity in solving this, uh, the, the problem that was faced by Vonage. So I, I don't believe that we're in some kind of a uh, crisis mode. More generally, this issue relates to the question of network neutrality, which has been debated in Washington for the last several years. And the cable industry, and I personally believe that this is a solution in search of a problem. Um, the, the, the fact is that the cable industry, and I believe it's true for DSL, uh, allow customers to choose or analyze or digest any content or any application they want on the Internet. Uh, cable Internet customers have, 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 I went back to a uh, 2003 fact sheet to see where we were then and see if it's true today, and it's still true. Cable still uh, provides unrestricted access to any ISP that you want. You can set any home page you want. If you sign up with Comcast, you spend about 30 seconds of your life on Comcast's home page and then reset it if you don't want to continue with that home page. You can con connect any modem device since, since 2003. Look at the enormous success, success, at least in a market sense, of Xbox, which, was, which is a Microsoft product, the, probably the leading company back uh, 18 or 24 months ago who was attacking the cable industry on network neutrality, and yet they've launched this enormously successful internet-based gaming uh, uh, solution for uh, customers, and other, other gamers are all uh, following their lead on the cable bandwidth. Um, and uh, the problem that we identified then and we continue to identify now in terms of a government solution is simply that if you use words like non-discrimination, I know we'll hear from our, our friends in academia on various approaches, uh, these become the basis for process, processes at the FCC uh, to essentially use the regulatory process to gain business negotiations. Companies like Amazon.com, Microsoft are, are, are fully capable of engaging in serious business negotiations with networks or with any other providers in the Internet space. But it always helps if you can threaten a governmental process against a provider of services if you don't get what you want at the a bargaining table. Uh, bringing the government into these debates on a, regula on a, on a regulatory rules basis as opposed to an enforcement basis, as was done in the case that, uh, that uh, raised this whole issue, uh, would, I think, bring a third stool to every negotiation uh, in the Internet space that is a prescription for uh, defeating the innovation that has made uh, broadband such a success story, indeed the signal success story of the 1996 Act. Thanks, James. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what sort of incentives might give rise to an, uh, a facilities-based uh, provider um, blocking VoIP ports? I mean, I don't run a network. What I can tell from the news seems to suggest that it's a rare occurrence. Um, some of it might well be inadvertence if you buy a firewall out of the box or if you're just being overly uh, protective of your network. You may just leave all the ports closed and uh, not be paying enough attention to what's going on. Um, in the VoIP space, and of course, um, some of the other products, not um, uh, uh, Vonage, of course, but some of the other products like Skype, um, uh, when they scan for ports, it looks like you're attacking the network. And so if you're being very protective of the network, you might be uh, shutting that out. Um, but apart from inadvertence or uh, 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 just non-enlightenment in terms of the new services that are coming out, um, there are a couple of reasons that seem to me that one might put forward as economically rational bases that a provider might block ports for VoIP. And I'm not saying they're doing it. Um, and uh, uh, as I say, I see very little evidence of it. The first one is for traffic management. Um, the second is to engage in price discrimination uh, among your customers. Uh, when you think that your VoIP, VoIP customers are your higher value customers, you want to charge them more. Uh, whether or not they're using more bandwidth, they've switched to VoIP because there's money to be saved over traditional voice services, and you as the infrastructure provider want to engage in a negotiation for some of that rent, right? That's an economically rational way to approach it. Um, and then the third way, uh, thing you might be trying to do if you're a infrastructure provider is to tr protect your traditional voice uh, revenues. The last of these is clearly uh, a concern from a consumer welfare perspective. The first two are not. 
Uh, that is to say, consumer welfare is not hurt if carriers uh, manage their traffic and protect their networks or if they engage in price discrimination. We might dislike price discrimination for other reasons, but we can't dislike it solely on consumer welfare grounds. Now, consumers have rights to respond to the issue, um, but I think their first right is to know what it is they're getting from their network provider. Um, uh, I agree that consumers should have some degree of control over their bandwidth management, but that alone doesn't do the job. Um, as we see the way Level 3, for example, grooms their network to let RTP go through faster or other sorts of services, um, we're reaching an environment where you can't just say every application is the same as every other application, um, or at least that's my perspective. Um, so what are the transition matters as we go into VoIP? Um, I think mostly we're going to find out that carriers realize that they want to give consumers what they want, and that is to maximize the number of applications um, available on the network. Now, what about this one anti-consumer rationale of protecting traditional voice uh, revenues? I mean, I'm optimistic that a small amount of competition will cause the ILEX to continue to see the light, as they have in many cases, to provide, well, you know, we're not all the way there yet, but the provision of naked DSL is growing. Um, one thing that sort of is a interesting interaction here is um, incentives and universal service subsidies don't come from the provision of naked DSL. They come from the provision of traditional voice services. And that, I mean, we all know universal service needs to be some, solved somehow, but this is yet another telecom regulatory problem that is being um, affected by uh, the universal service system. Now, let me wrap up by just saying a, first, a few things about remedies and what the law ought to provide. Um, notwithstanding my friend here, I'm not going to suggest an overly aggressive um, legal structure. The first thing, of course, is the law should uh, 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 promote more facilities-based competition, and uh, my personal hobby horse on this is spectrum reform, but um, uh, uh, I don't want to talk about that very much. I do think that we need a fundamental interconnection obligation uh, that the FCC can enforce. I'd like to see them enforce it on an ex-post basis and not on an ex-ante basis, applying very rigorous screens that ask questions like, are these problems being solved in the market? Not an antitrust case. Right? I was on a panel a couple weeks ago and we fought hard about what Trinco means. But if Trinco means anything, it means that denials of interconnections are strategic devices that probably don't violate the antitrust laws in most cases. Um, so I think we need a different kind of reasoning, but as close to competition law as we get. In that regard, I sort of have to disagree with um, Jeff a little bit. My non-discrimination requirement would be much re weaker. An application is not an application. A bit is not a bit. Um, uh, as long as we have fundamental interconnection, though, I think we can protect the vast majority of consumer rights. Um, and I'll turn it over to Tim. Okay, great. So, yeah, you know, the, uh, for several years now, the, the uh, broadband providers have been saying about network neutrality, and this is really all about network neutrality. They've been saying this is a, uh, a solution in, in search of a problem, but we now, we now have the problem. I mean, this is the problem. This is the evidence. The Madison River case is, is the kind of problem that network neutrality theory predicted. And fortunately, through uh, the actions of the FCC, we also have the solution. And I think the solution to this case is a paradigm or a model for uh, discussing what the future of telecom reform should look like. The, the kind of things you see the FCC doing without clear authority, without, without, um, you know, without a clear uh, without the, the, a, a very clear basis for what exactly it's doing, are, however, the, the, they are right now focusing on the problems of trying to guarantee a neutral network. This is what Powell's been saying with his network freedom ideas, and I think really offers us an example of what the problems will be in the broadband age and what the kind of solutions will be. So what the basic question here is what are the interests, the same academic question that Jim brought up, what are the interests of a broadband carrier in discriminating against content? Um, and I agree with Jim that in general, in general, broadband carriers have an interest in letting their customers uh, get as much content and services as possible. That makes it more valuable. That, I, I agree with this basic premise. So, I mean, it wouldn't make sense, for example, to offer a DSL service that didn't, didn't give you access to Google. No one would buy it, you know, and, and they'd go somewhere else. But the question, and all the hard questions come when it comes when the carrier is offering a competing service. You know, when the carrier is offering a competing service, then the, the, the story becomes more complicated. And there are reasons or certain situations where there may be discrimination against the competing service, which is in the interest 
of the carrier but not in the interest of the public. Uh, Jim already discussed some of these examples. Uh, they, uh, they, they, you know, when you have a primary monopoly such as the, such as the DSL carriers in, in, in voice, uh, there's obvious incentives to try and protect that. One thing we haven't really discussed but will, I think, within the next five or ten years be an issue is what happens when you have serious competition for video. How interested are the cable companies going to be in allowing inter the Internet connections they're providing undermine their market, their domination in the video market or the television market. And so the, the real point here is that there, the, it is ambiguous and it can depend on the broadband carrier as to what degree they want to discriminate. And that itself is a dangerous thing. The Internet should be, and I've said this before, like the electric network. It should be something. We have a national economy. Uh, Manufacturers of consumer devices should be able to market these devices that work in every broadband home and don't work one way in one home and one way in another home. It would be absurd if you bought a toaster and it worked in Wisconsin and it didn't work in Wyoming. <laughs> Similarly, today, if you plug in your Internet phone in South Carolina, you may get a different performance than if you plug it in in Nebraska than if you plug it in in New York City. And I think that is a dangerous, a bad situation in and of itself for market entry at the application level. So I'll leave it there and, and, and that's the point of network neutrality is to create a national economy in network attachment and network services. Thank you. You guys were very good in adhering to the time uh, uh, that we've laid out for you guys. Um, I think that you all can really respond to one another pretty ably and, and I hope that you do. But I have a couple of questions um, and one is to start with I want each of you guys uh, to identify, you know, what authority you, you think the FCC has to take action against a carrier or, or any kind of provider um, if at some point in the future the FCC determines that pretty much all providers are information service providers. Um, and I know that, Professor Spader, you have written about this. You've written about kind of what the what you know what the FCC's authority is under Title I, which is pretty broad, pretty vague. Some could argue that it's not very definitive. And as a result, in in one of your papers, I've noticed you've written about and you talked about the issue and the importance of having these basic sort of um, default interconnection rules for providers. And I, and I'm hoping that you can talk about that too. But you know, when I was thinking about this panel, I thought that um, it's kind of an interesting legal question, which is if this were to take place and, you know, in the future, let's say a company like Madison River becomes an information service provider, what is the FCC's jurisdiction to perhaps address something like, address that type of um, behavior? So why don't you start, Mr. Citron? <clears throat> well, I think you, you hit the point right there. And again, I open my remarks. It shouldn't matter what your definition is as to what kind of enforcement action is available. But the practical reality today is, had Madison River been a cable operator, I'm not sure that the cable that the FCC could have brought an action under Title II against them because they're largely uh, regulated under Title I. And I'm not sure that under Title I they would have an appropriate remedy. So, in fact, if Madison River were a cable operator, maybe this port blocking would be still be ongoing right now, and the marketplace wouldn't cure that problem, which would require, of course, rules to be to be passed. So that leaves a very vexing question: Do we go ahead and, and make cable? <laughs> Uh, be regulated under Title II in order to solve this enforcement component, or do we pass another rule that allows for uh, some form of uh, anti-blocking and neutrality to be uh, be put in place? Now, there was a question earlier mentioned about, you know, is this really a fluke, uh, or is it benign? Um, no, it's not benign, and no, it's not a fluke. It's actually just inevitable. It's going to happen. It's going to happen more and more. It's going to happen as more and more services get deployed over these applications, whether it's other voice services, whether it's gaming services, or whether it's video services, you will see more blocking unless there's some mechanism in place that says, no, this is not allowed, and yet there's some enforcement me mechanism in place that can punish carriers for doing it. Well, the, the, the answer to your question, I think, Jessica, is very complicated. Uh, first, is it, uh, for, the, I know. for the legal answer, <laughs> uh, the commission declared uh, in March of 2002 that uh, 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 2003, the cable modem service is an information service and then issued a series of questions in a further notice asking what does that mean? So many of the questions that uh, not just related to these kinds of issues but uh, 
other obligations of an information service uh, provider in this context are, are yet to be answered. And I think it's, it's premature to assume that the Commission uh, has neither the authority nor the wisdom to come to the right answers on these. Um, the second question, and I, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't want to put myself in a defensive mode, but it is at least worth asking, particularly since we're trying to have an open, honest discussion about this. Uh, the cable, and, and this is by no means a, I, I want to understand that the cable does not block, we don't block, we have a competing product in, hun, in dozens of markets and we'll have in hundreds of markets that compete with Jeffrey's product, and we don't block. Uh, we're in that market. Why do we, why do we not block? Why do we why do we uh, why do we see that as a, a place we don't go? Because we think we have a competitive product that has a quality of service that has a consumer interface. Uh, the customer is familiar with the, for example, Time Warner Cable in Portland, Maine. They're familiar with that company. They know the local customer service is right there in the community. Uh, they may they may like the idea of a bundled pricing opportunity uh, that comes with it. So, you know, cable is competing head to head with Vonage, uh, with uh, traditional circuit switch carriers, with cellular, uh, to the extent that that's viewed as a full competitor. And, th and, and that, is the, that is the right approach. It is the approach we're taking. But I would caution you uh, to be careful with your use of language when you say this carrier is this and that carrier is that, because cable uh, introduced itself into this market, into the broadband market, on a voluntary private risk basis. It's true that we passed over existing rights of way, no question about that. And as many of you know, the history of cable and, and cable modem service, we assented to the municipal view that this was a cable service. Uh, and it was only when the commission de determined it to be an information service that we stopped and were forbidden from continuing to pay franchise fees on it. So it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not at all clear that the service is a, quote, carrier in any sense of the word that you would apply that to a traditional rate of return carrier such as the, such as the, uh, uh, the uh, offending party, you know, in the, in the case that we're considering. We've never been a quick carrier in that term. Now, when Cox or somebody else introduces circuit switched phone services, they have, and, and AT&T did, and now Comcast offers it as a circuit switch product, we are carriers. We accept the designation both at the federal and state level. But uh, let's be careful in uh, identifying networks that do not hold themselves, uh, hold themselves out as carriers, as somehow ipso facto carriers, there may be a strong public policy to do so, but, but it's not an inevitable legal conclusion by the way they introduce their service. There are lots of, there are, you know, there are lots of distributors in, in society from you know, hotel, hotels to uh, land parks to uh, other uh, office, off, uh, uh, providers of telecommunications that do not fit the Title II definition uh, that uh, the ILEX have willingly, uh, voluntarily accepted over nearly a, uh, 80 years of service in the United States. Thanks. Um, well, I'm going to say something that's never in the interest of an academic to say, but I don't think it's all that complicated, actually. Um, I don't think, and, I, and this is what uh, uh, Jessica was referring to, I don't think the FCC has Title I authority to do these uh, sorts of orders at all. Um, uh, so I say that with some degree of um, trepidation, however, because I don't want to discount the possibility that um, the fear of waking up the regulatory giant uh, is the reason that many carriers are playing nice right now. Sorry. Um, uh, you know, deny, uh, deny access to applications, deny access to services, deny access to unaffiliated VoIP services. That's more likely to get you on the radar screen out here in Washington. And um, so it's with some trepidation that I conclude that, you know, Title I just doesn't do the work. Now so, I, wait a minute. So let me just ask a quick question. So you do not think, let me just be clear about this, you, you do not think that the FCC's jurisdiction under Title I is sufficient? No, I don't think okay. the FCC's jurisdiction under Title I is sufficient. I do think, you know, um, uh, uh, our buddy Phil Weiser um, has written an article saying that he thinks it's uh, sufficient, and it does say all communications by wire or radio, and, and sort of the sort of technical legal argument has to be that the rulemaking authority that exists in Title I is just for housekeeping rules. It's not for substantive legal standards. The only substantive legal uh, lawmaking authority that the FCC has comes from the particular titles, Title II, III, VI, um, et cetera. Um, and that's the way I read the history. That's the way I read it. I think it, you know, um, I think it would be hard in a case to say, 
uh, that you could identify enough evidence of Congress uh, wanting to go that far. Um, but that's just how I read the, the, the cases. Um, on the other hand, though, I've also written that I think that there's plenty of uh, uh, reasonable arguments to be made for finding that um, Internet carriers are carriers, right? right. Not, in co not, in, not in the way we talk about Title II common carriers, but in the way we talk about carriers as the people who transport things from the history of farriers to railroads to telegraphs to telephones. And, and I think uh, uh, it's just intellectually um, easy to say that they are carriers of some sort. Now, you know, I'm an academic, so I'd like to write a new law that makes it clear what kinds of carriers they are and that it imports only the light degree of regulation that I would like. Um, but if the, if the Supreme Court comes down in Brand X and the FCC has to say that cable modem service is a Title II service and will forbear uh, to a significant degree, the world's not going to end. Um, it's not going to end in any way. Right. Yeah, so, you know, the question the question of Title I, uh, the p power under Title I, I think depends as, t as to what exactly the FCC thinks it is doing and what, it's, uh, you know, what it, it is doing. And I, I think that um, you know, it might be one thing to impose all the full common carrier requirements of Title II through Title I. I don't think you do that. But a simple non-discrimination rule of the kind you saw in this case is kind of the very basic fundamental thing that you have in any kind of telecommunications regulation. So I think that you know, if you can't even have a non-discrimination rule, uh, a non-discrimination rule under Title I, then it, 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 it would be a strange absence of power. Uh, and anyway, I think the question is a little bit, um, I don't want to say irrelevant, but I think it's clear the FCC has the greater power in any case to decide if it wanted to back up and say that this, these services are all Title II services anyway. I mean, it's pretty easy to, to fit either DSL or cable, if you feel like it, into the, the, into the, tra the definition of telecommunications service, and in fact, it's probably a more natural fit. Um, it just has these sometimes absurd consequences that require forbearance. But anyway, the point is the FCC has the greater power, and so some of this, this question is a little bit of a, of a technicality. You know, I mean, it, it could do it if it really wanted to. It, it's just a question of what it wants to do it with. So, um, so what do you think the FCC and or the Hill should do in this area um, as we look at, you know, changing the statute, which clearly is on the tip of everybody's minds? Don't all, don't all wait. Don't all jump in at once. Nothing. <laughs> um, go ahead. No, I mean, I think, I think we take a look at the wrong approach. I mean, I want to go back and sort of address one of the early comments. First, I think it's more appropriate. You know, cable does not block. That's the, the, the word we keep hearing. Cable doesn't block. Cable doesn't block. Okay, cable doesn't block. Why does cable object so much to a very simple rule that says they won't block? And that's like a big question. It's quite interesting in some of the hearings when the CEOs of uh, SBC and Verizon were asked questions about whether or not they were, were engaging in, in, in blocking of uh, voice or IP ports, they, of course, articulated that no, that they were not. They were asked if there's any intent to do so. They said there was no intent to do so. Then they were asked, would you uh, object to any consideration on this merge or be placed on you that would, entail, that would require you not to block in the future? And they said, absolutely not. So why do we keep hearing that no one blocks, no one thinks it's good to block, it's not in anyone's economics interest to block, no one wants a rule about blocking. I think, you know, addressing the larger set of laws and, and questions about definitions and where things that this is a problem that's not going to be solved overnight, and I'm not even sure it's a problem that we want to go out and solve. I think what we do want to do is look at some very simple prescribed sets of solutions for different key critical areas. There's probably a couple of key critical points in neutrality, or what I call consumer bill of rights, that would probably address 90 percent of the concerns that exist today and leave open the ability to address the other ones as, as markets fail. Uh, consumers, I think you have those same areas and other social obligations like access to emergency services, interconnection, um, uh, except universal service, et cetera. Well, excuse me, Jim. Uh, let me answer what seems like a fair question. Um, so, uh, well, that's the way that Tim always starts. So, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get into that, but stop. Uh, no impersonating. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Uh, there's, a, there's a rule. Uh, we have members of the House, uh, people who work, at, work on the, the Senate and House staff, uh, do not block. Okay, well, okay, the Comcast says, hmm, you know, we block hundreds if not thousands of unwanted spam for our cu customers. Uh, maybe this rule won't, well, oh, we're going to have an exception for spam. Well, how are we going to identify that? 
So you have a uh, litigation over what's, what is uh, allowed blocking, which the customer wants you to block, namely spam, and don't block Jeffrey's service because it's, it's not spam, it's something else. Um, and you then begin uh, down that road. How about uh, 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 Tim Wu's suggestion that we have a general non-discrimination principle? Um, attractive certainly uh, has a historical uh, uh, ring to it in terms of uh, other areas of the law, but the fact is when Microsoft introduced its Xbox, and this was at a time when Microsoft was on, I think, a, a, the warpath against the cable industry, they had deals with cable operators to help launch Xbox, uh, cooperating with companies like Charter and others to begin that product. So that was hardly non-discrimination. We, we took a position on that. Or if we favor a particular uh, company like Amazon on the home page of Comcast, is that discrimination? Uh, if we if, if in, at some point we decide to uh, accelerate somebody's access to a particular uh, gaming application because it makes the game more fun or because the complexity of the game requires acceleration, is that discrimination? You bring the government into every one of these negotiations. Now, is this, am I, is this a parade of horribles that's never been proved? I submit to you um, words like unbundled network elements and the ability of the commission, Congress, the courts, the Supreme Court three times the, or twice, the, the Court of Appeals four times, the FCC five times, to try to come up with what the words necessary and impair meant when Congress passed those seemingly simple, straightforward words in the 1996 Act. It resulted in thousands of pages of rejected views by the FCC after lots and lots of hours and hours of work. So it is not easy. It is not easy and simple to have basic words interpreted in a highly competitive context and expect the FCC to come up with clear and easy answers. What, it, what does seem to work better at the FCC, at least my experience having worked there for seven years and been a student of it for a little longer, is in the enforcement area where you have a clear, where you have a clear offense, the commission can quickly gather the facts and give the commission, if, the, if there's anything, the commission should have the resources to address issues like Jeffrey's concern in this one instance and if there are other cases that Jeffrey brings. And I think it's important to bring the cases, not just talk about them publicly, but actually bring them before the regulator and get a quick and, response, and responsive answer from the regulator. And if the regulator doesn't answer quickly, then Congress should sit on the regulator to get the answer quickly because if, if there is a violation in this, in this space, it needs to be addressed quickly. But a general rule, I, I, I have to agree uh, with, with Jim, no. What's, what's, uh, just one question, though. what's the basis for the enforcement action? If a cable operator blocks bonds today, on the what basis would you accept, as the cable industry, enforcement? On a discrimination basis, obviously. Well, I think which one? <laughs> well, what law? I mean, what law in today's act is cable modem service required? I think you believe my, you know, my attorney, Mr. Wu. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's, it's a real general concern because well, cable operators say that we're not. Let, we're not I, again, I think facts are very important in these cases. You know, this is an area where. Uh, people can make uh, very strong claims because the internet is important to all of us. The reason we have this internet caucus with uh, a few thousand companies signed up for it is because we do care about this. We know we're on to something very important in America and in the world. This is changing things very, and we don't want to have uh, individual companies or individual regulations thwart that development. It, it's permitted a company like yours to bring a terrific competitive phone product that didn't exist, could not exist in the circuit switched world and didn't exist under the 1996 Act, resale, UNE. Uh, you still haven't answered my question. But the, under, what, under what law or what premise does FCC have the authority to tell a comp cable company stop blocking, blocking bondage and issue them a censure and a fine? Uh, I'd like to know because we can't find it in our law books. And my lawyers are sitting in the law room. They're not really sure what the right answers are. So you can meet my well, lawyer, Mr. Bill Wilhelm, over there. <laughs> fantastic lawyer, and I, I wish him every good wish with his problem. But the <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the the answer is let, let's get the facts. Let's find out. You know, if it were to happen, which it hasn't happened. You know, I'm well, very it actually is happening right now with the cable operator. And I'll, I'll disclose right. the facts of the cable operator that helps. So use Madison River. I mean, Madison River blocked bondage of service. They actually one day came in and blocked ports 50, 60, 50, 61, and 50, 62, which are well-known ports that have been identified for the use of transmitting SIP signals. All right, I want to hear from James Spada and you guys. What do you guys think about this? Well, my nothing comment off the cuff was an expression for uh, a regulatory structure that proceeds ex post, that waits for the development of problems and then adjudicates them, uh, but is based on a requirement that uh, not of antitrust law in, in the case of interconnection, but of something like uh, an interconnection um, uh, requirement. What I mean, would it I look think like? It, it, what would the interconnection yeah. requirement uh, what, look what like? Would, what would this idea that you've proposed, 
Which is, I think, quite interesting and provocative. What would it look like? Well, you, well, you have to define the FCC's regulatory authority to be broad enough to include all two-way networks and logical services necessary to the operation and interconnection of those networks. And then you use language like um, interoperability and interconnection. Um, uh, the FCC shall have the power to order interoperability and interconnection of uh, fundamental services in cases in which the market has been found to not provide the level of interconnection that maximizes consumer welfare. Um, you know, that's a bunch of academic talk. I don't know. I, I'm, legislative counsel is a, is a job I've never aspired to. Um, sorry. Uh, but be, just because I can't figure out how, to, uh, how exactly to do it. But I think, I think that's the that's where we, there, there are only two choices if, there, if the statute is going to do something honest about telecommunications regulation. Um, and then there's a middle ground which, uh, which, might, which might be the best ground, but I don't think covers all of the bases honestly. The first honest basis is to bring all of the networks under the FCC's regulatory authority and to, to deal with the consequences of that um, by figuring out just how much regulatory authority should be cut back and how much should be retained. The second of which is to just stop um, and do antitrust, um, but I, I, I'm not in favor of that. Then there's the middle ground of the IP migration model, which would give the FCC authority over over your networks and other two-way networks in exchange for very light regulation. So that, wait a minute. So w would it be added to Title One? Is that how you would do it? Uh, that's what the proposal for the I, what's being called the IP migration model. I think uh, Chairman Powell used that term first. Okay. Um, would do. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, the, he, here's the interesting question, and this uh, picks up on something Tim started with, which is um, the blocking requirement or the non-discrimination requirement in a, a world in which we're a managed service world, in which the cable company's VoIP product has a channel set aside, I mean, for lack of a better way to describe it, um, and gets a higher QoS than just regular internet service. And by the way, they managed to just keep their internet channel down to six so that, you know, stuff down there, there's not three channels and six channels and hundreds and hundreds of megabits available, although that is available for their video channels right now. Um, that's where the where push comes to shove um, uh, when an unaffiliated provider says we'd like to you know do a deal for the same QoS and the cable companies say say no. Now my view is that we should think about those things mainly from an antitrust perspective on an ex post basis, but we need to give the FCC regulatory authority to even think about it. Tim, let me try and answer. So I think there's a, a fairly practical uh, answer. The question is, what should the FCC and what should the Hill do? I think the FCC has, and I think we should face it, basically created a de facto network neutrality system regime. It's not really clear what its statutory basis is. It's uh, described in a series of speeches and, and enforcement actions like the ones we've seen, but it exists in some sense. Um, uh, Chairman Powell, as everyone in this room knows, gave his Four Freedoms speech, which is essentially endorsed the idea that pe users should have the rights to access the applications and services they would like to access. And he's now shown, or the FCC has now shown, that in, least, uh, in these cases they will enforce this on a certain basis. What I think that that model, that basic model where the FCC is looking at the network, at the Internet and, and other services, and seeing a basic two-layer of services, transport provided by carriers, services pa provided by other companies, and acting primarily with an eye to preventing the carriers from discriminating as between services, is a model for the reform of the entire Telecommunications Act. I think that the, 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 you know, this, basic this basic model is what, what the entire Telecommunications Act would look like, and I don't think we need much more than that with, and a couple more add-ons. So I think we are in the midst of, you know, through this kind of process, um, seeing what works, and forgetting about all these stupid questions about like what Title I is and what Title II is and moving forward towards a model where we are focused on the problems of transport, the problems of applications, and as I've said, the problem of discrimination as between them. It's a light-handed approach. It's actually ra rather deregulatory compared to what we have now. And that's what I, that's really what I think the future of telecom reform is. So, Dan, do you agree with that? I agree with the light-handed approach. Uh, <laughs> and let me answer your question, Jeffrey. My, 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 uh, 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 Jim was much more articulate than I was in, in saying it, it, it <coughs> describing it as an ex post as opposed to an ex ante problem. In other words, I would like, I would not like to set out rules ahead of the game, to put it in sort of regulatory ease, uh, that 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 state all the rules and see if look at the fa the specific facts of a problem that you encounter with the particular party that you're talking about. 
Um, if, uh, if it's one of the members that I represent, I'd be very concerned. I don't believe it is. Um, and uh, take a look at what they're doing, why they're doing it, their explanations for it, and uh, take it from there. Um, but to develop broad principles that then can be used as a negotiating tool in the Internet context is a, is a formula uh, to stymie innovation. Uh, and I think uh, that's been the experience of broad rules that have been applied in an area where everybody agrees there needed to be more competition, which was in local phone service. I mean, the, the great irony of the, no, not the great irony, there are so many ironies, that it, but the 96 Act was all about local phone competition, and, and the only place it's really emerged in a, in a very vigorous way has come outside of the, of the vision of the authors of the 96 Act, namely <coughs> through your products, and I wouldn't say Celex, not at all, but, but by and large, the, the really exciting innovation is coming through a mechanism that was not anticipated by the regulators. So I'm very wary uh, of, of turning these questions over to, once again, regulatory uh, and, and statutory definitions that will bind the marketplace instead of free it. So you feel that any level of government intervention will really be, um, will really be a, a barrier to... Not, not any level, but the enforcement action in this case is, is, is appropriate. It was done speedily. It was done uh, efficiently, and in the end, the carrier that did the blocking responded and reacted uh, t uh, and accepted, and, and, and that's that. And that's what we need if we find things that, as a policy matter, clearly indicate the kind of behavior that we don't want to see on the Internet from certain, um, uh, certain named defendants. Tim, and, and then... Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I'm, I'm glad that... that uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree with the idea that this is, as I said, a model. The enforcement we've had in this action is a model. I just this question about ex post versus ex ante. Um, you know, it's hard to see how you have ex ante ex post enforcement if you don't have an ex ante rule. There has to be something, right? There has to be some basis on under which you have decided that this is wrongful behavior before you decide to do anything. Uh, about it. Now, in this case, there was an ex ante rule. There was an announcement by Chairman Powell that if carriers discriminated against VoIP or other application providers, that they would be cracked down upon. That was the ex ante rule, and the ex post enforcement is what we see today. So, you know, to say that we shouldn't have any ex ante rule, it's, in, you know, sort of impossible to say, because there has to be some standard by which you ex post judge the action. Now, I, I, but I'm sensitive to, to the point that you, if you, the, the, the danger is having too many classifications. I think the, I mean, the, the problem of the 1996 Act and of telecom law in general is this, this, the costs of classifications. But my anti-discrimination principle is just that, a principle which is in force in an ex post facto to decide whether, in fact, this is harmful discrimination, to decide ex post whether this is something that caused consumer harm. It's an ex post, ex anti-standard, which is ex post investigated. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, th yeah. I think that's that's absolutely right. T Tim and I, I guess, are not that far apart. I prefer to describe the ex ante rule as an interconnection rule because I think, and, and, and this is an important difference, I think, I, I'm very wary of creating a non-discrimination rule that allows arguments that make all applications applications, right? I actually think I would be very reluctant to find that, you know, managed QoS raises discrimination rules. Um, uh, that's because I may be more optimistic than Tim is about how much competition there will be in the market. Um, uh, but I, I think we've seen, you know, a relatively low level of competition is forcing sort of fundamental changes. We've seen it with the DSL rollouts. We've seen it with, you know, I mean, I don't know if anybody here is from SBC, but, you know, many of the other ILECs are, are providing naked DSL and, and doing so on a competitive basis because they have to. Um, uh, and, you know, so I think th the reason I use the ex ante rule of interconnection is because of this really hard problem of saying application A and application B um, uh, should be subject to a non-discrimination requirement. Mr. Citron, do you, do you agree with that? Well, partially. I, I do agree, first of all, one, you need a standard by which to be judged. In the Mass River case, there was a standard. The right. discrimination rules were, were set forth in Title II, and, of course, the Commission judged them accordingly. Uh, Central and fine was put in place. Problem resolved. In a, a case with a cable operator, this will be more complicated because the, the, to judge the standard, a standard must exist 
a standard that doesn't exist unless the cable companies want to adopt the standards with inside Title II, which apparently they do not want, which are, of course, much more strict and, and heavy-handed. So we do need something, a basis. But if we come up with something that's more generic that talks about what is we're trying to prevent from happening, in a sense, we can allow the FCC as a, as a designated agency to evaluate that post uh, post de facto to see what really happened. You know, we have lots of interesting laws in this country. You know, you know we have the ability to, to speak freely. That right doesn't allow us to walk into a movie theater and scream fire. We have the ability to judge that right, and sometimes those judgments become very, very hard and difficult to see, but yet there's still a method of adjudicating. We definitely absolutely need that capability. But I do want to disagree with the fact that not all applications are created zero, uh, equally. They really are. An application is nothing more than transmitting data. Data is nothing more than a zero and a one. If reduced to an optical circuit, it's nothing more than a photon of light. I can't tell the difference between one photon of light and another. And I got to tell you, all ones in the world look like ones, and all zeros look like zeros. So we do need to set some standards around those elements. Um, I don't disagree that we shouldn't have given network operators the ability to provide some form of QoS. But I think more importantly, it's really not about the network operator doing something for the benefit of the network operator. It's really the network operator doing something for the benefit of a consumer. So of course, that consumer should be ultimately be the judge of that benefit, and you have the ability to tune, tweak, or change the service accordingly. This is great. Okay, we need to open it up for questions now from the audience, and I don't want anybody to be shy. Stand up. This is a great discussion and really important topic, so please raise your hand. Give the audience some. Yeah, uh, we, have, we have lots of great questions. Mr. Simmerman from NCTA. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, application, or are you the question of network operator versus consumer, and I don't want to make a big statement, but network operators sometimes do things for the benefit of all of the users of the network. The problem in the case of a cable network is that it's a shared system. So when a network is so if a consumer has all the control and the network operator does not, then I think there's a problem in the last example you just gave, which is QoS may be for everyone's benefit. But the real question is you were about to name the cable operator that was uh, transgressing for Jessica had hit it early, uh, cut you off earlier, and I wanted to get into that for a moment with a, a follow-up if you're willing to name the operator. Sure. Well, I'll, let me just the first the first part of the question. You know, it's it's a tricky balance, You're right? The network operator needs to protect their network from harm, and that's obviously got to be the first priority. And so, even if that means sort of doing something that may degrade all user services equally, including those services of, shall we say, affiliated voice, I think uh, we would not have a problem with that. Um, clearly, when the network operator is doing something to degrade the quality of, of one service to improve the quality of something else, and that service happens to be the thing they sell. At a premium, well, that's a different story because the consumer should have the right to choose whether or not their service gets de degraded in favor of something else or, quite frankly, some else's service. I mean, imagine if my neighbor paid a premium to go ahead and get better service than me as a customer. Um, do we think that's fair? Do we think that's how the, wor the world should work? Should we allow our cell phone companies? Should I be allowed to buy cell phone service yes, today? Um, <laughs> no, but I should, should I be allowed seriously to buy a cell phone service that goes ahead and always provides me a perfect signal always. I can always make a phone call at the sacrifice of another, of another customer who can't afford to, to pay a, a premium. So I think that's on the network side is one set of questions. But when you deliver a, a, a product to a customer at the end of the day, that product has to have, have, have a meaning. When you tell a customer selling you broadband, that customer expects to get broadband. That customer says the broadband always be there. They expect to always be able to transmit and receive data at sufficient speed level. The customer should not have to worry about his speed level going to zero because the cable operator took his, all of his broadband away and, and gave it to somebody else. And I presume that that's not what the network operators intend to do. And of course, we've never seen network, network operators do that. But we recognize those, those dichotomies. But when a consumer is given a megabit of service, let the consumer decide what they should do with that megabit, whether they should use it for downloading video or playing video games or, or going in, uh, and, and making a voice over IP call. As for the cable operator, I'm not going to disclose at this point, but I'll talk to you about it later on. Well, my understanding, tell me if I'm wrong, I won't name the name, but that it's an, actually an overbuilder, which is different than what I would call a cable operator that may provide cable service. But, uh, you know, only Jim has really talked about competition and said the answer is promoting facilities-based competition. My understanding is that in that instance, this entity, which is not a member of ours as I understand it, uh, you know, there is at least a uh, real cable operator that someone can switch to. There's a DSL operator that someone can switch to. Uh, you know, this entity that uh, got the law changed in their state to avoid the level playing field statutes there. Um, uh, you know, if, if there's a problem, then deal with it. There's a lot of interesting situations. But I just want on the record that 
you know, as far as we know, it is not a traditional cable operator and it is not a member of NCTA. So that when we go into a legislative hearing, we don't have rumor cable operators. <laughs> Well, I will confirm. The, the, the cable operator is, is, to our best of our knowledge, not a member of the NCTA. Um, I can't tell you whether or not that they're an overbuild or not. I really don't know, nor that, do I really think it matters. I don't know that if one cable company should be treated differently than another cable company from the purposes of whether or not they should be allowed to, right. to, um, block, ser to block services. Right. I think the point is that the overbuilders have, you know, sometimes called for net neutrality rules themselves, but in any case, they're not just cable operators. I mean, they're, uh, you know, they, they have sort of a different business model, a different plan. But, you know, there's multiple competitors out there, too, that someone can turn to. It's not as big as... Well, let me, let me adjust that question, because I think you, you assume something in the record that's not maybe a fact. I don't know for the customers that were affected in the Vonage network if all those customers had the ability to go out and choose an alternate provider. Because even though you're an overbuilder, doesn't mean that there's a cable running from the, shall I say, the incumbent cable operator in that market going to that customer's home, nor does it assume that there's a DSL service. I mean, maybe one of my customers, by chance, didn't have a choice to go ahead and switch, and therefore was left with only one overbuilder as their only provider of broadband services. Furthermore, my customer may have made an investment in equipment, hardware, and signed a contract, right, to go ahead and get that service. And by switching, we'd wind up having to, A, suffer a monetar monetary po uh, penalty for ending his contract early. Two, would have to forfeit certain amounts of equipment that he's already spent money on to buy different equipment in order to be able to connect up to a different network, in particular if it was, a, if it was switching from cable um, to DSL. And why should we force this customer to do that just because of the bad act of a cable operator, and one of which we can't figure out what law to go ahead and figure out how to penalize him against because we don't know which law or set of standards he's supposed to follow because there is no standard in Title I and we're not really sure what the standard and we don't believe that the Title II standard may apply accordingly. Tim, uh, yeah, and this then is, Dan. I mean, this, this, this question stresses, uh, shows the importance <laughs> of a uniform network neutrality regime. If we have this discussion over whether you're an overbuilder, whether you're a member of the NTCA, whether you're a DSL <laughs> carrier, whether you're, you know, whatever you are, and then you have a different rule and, you know, they're trying to sell a product that, that is, you know, supposed to work on every internet connection, you have a absurd, you know, you have this, yeah, what's a consumer? The consumer doesn't know what an overbuilder is or what, I mean, they have no idea. They just know their, their thing isn't working. And then the complaint is, well, you know, they weren't, they're not subject to Title I, they're subject to Title V. You need, you know, Title 35, I mean, whatever. You need, that's the problem. That's why there needs to be a, a system which guarantees that your broadband connection, there needs to be a single regime for broadband, and a, and a system that guarantees that you have the right to use the applications of your choice regardless of what your broadband carrier is and not have to depend on these things that have to do with nothing. I love your, uh, uh, I love your electric wait, argument, uh, I mean. Tim, <laughs> and then Dan. I, mean, I want to say one more historical an antecedent. The most successful, this is just like the question of phone attachments. In the 1960s, the, the FCC decided that the consumers, actually the D.C. Circuit decided, the consumers have a right to connect whatever they want to their telephone as long as it's not harmful to the network. That allowed us to have, first of all, phones made companies by companies other than Bell, which was a big step forward, answering machines, modems and computers, fax machines, and ultimately the whole internet based on modems. And so, you know, the, we have a very successful antecedent in this area of consumers' rights to attach things, and we need the same kind of rules for the internet. Sorry. Yeah. Dan Brenner, and then, and then James. Yeah, I, I think that the, that the point that, that Rick raises is actually a little bit more complicated <laughs> than a global solution, uh, a broad anti-discrimination principle. And what we're getting at, or I think what Rick's point in, in the conversation, the colloquy with Jeffrey is about, is the subscriber agreement. The, 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 the customer signs an agreement as to what the service is going to be provided is. Now let's assume, just hypothetically, okay, since we are dealing in some hypotheticals here since we only have one adjudicated case, Let's say there was a third provider of broadband, and that broadband provider wanted to offer an innovative service, innovative, in which uh, th the price would be much lower than either the phone company or the incumbent ca cable company by essentially t taking uh, payments from different providers on the network, okay? And they would say, you know, we're going to offer, like in the old days, remember the old days of free dial-up um, uh, uh, ISP access? And they said you could get free ISP access if you're willing to take a bunch of ads. Some people said, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that. Others said, okay, I'll take it. I think net zero at one point, that was their formulation of how they were going to introduce it into the market. Well, let's say some new broadband provider, maybe a wireless or Wi-Fi <laughs> provider, decides that's the only way we can penetrate this market, uh, is by offering some product like that, which is highly uh, discriminatory, fully laid out in the subscriber agreement, but that's a product we want to try to introduce. And there may be some customers we can pick off from DSL and cable and, and broadband over power line by doing this. Clearly not network neutral, but 
but clearly a choice in the market. Under your principle, Tim, that, that enterprise could never come into existence. That option could never be in front of consumers because it would violate a federal standard as opposed to an agreement that might be reached in a, custom, a private agreement between the customer and the provider. I think that's wrong. James. Um, <coughs> that, I mean, I think, I, think that's, I think that's basically right. I mean, I said the first consumer right is the right to know what you're getting from your broadband provider. And so we have these two bodies of law which are um, much more incredibly specialized than telecom law called contract law and fraud that if you're not getting what you're buying, you have cause of action for damages. Um, and I would you know, like to rely on that body of law um, to a significant extent. Now, what Tim should be able to say in response is that um, the network neutrality is an efficient default rule, that all customers, if they were negotiating their contracts with full information, would insist on getting a network neutrality rule. And here, um, I just have to beg to differ. I just don't think that's the case. I think that we have a lot of um, uh, examples of consumers wanting the ultimate result of the service and not, um, uh, not being concerned uh, about a lot. But if he wants to make an economic case, the economic case is that network neutrality is the efficient default contract rule, um, but I don't think there's any um, uh, evidence for that. As to phone attachments, we're just not in that world. We're just not in a world where a rate-regulated monopolist is, is, has the incentive to extend its monopoly by restricting competition in attachments. We're in a world in which the carriers are largely not rate-regulated, um, at least on the broadband side. Uh, and, and so they have every incentive to only internalize those uh, complementary goods which it's efficient to internalize. And I agree that there's some val consumer value to having nationwide consumer um, uh, equipment markets, but I don't think nationwide is the minimum efficient scale for consumers. We can have um, uh, uh, different markets. Now, the last point is this point about three and four providers. When we get away from pure competition, in which everybody has the incentive to gain the maximum network effect by interconnecting, and away from the world of monopoly, in which the single monopolist ensures that the entire network effect is gained, and we get to two and three and four players, then the economics of monopolistic competition become quite problematic, and denial of interconnection and interoperability becomes a rational private strategy in which that doesn't match up with total social welfare. And this is the need for some specialized ex-ante rule. I call it interconnection. Tim calls it network neutrality. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Randy Beard. I'm with Tech Daily. Um, there is a precedent you probably know about it since you guys have been in this business a long time, which was the Bell companies and the ISPs back in the mid-90s. They were at war with one another, as I'm sure you remember, and the Bell companies did everything they could to block, degrade, uh, say that the ISPs could not have interconnections, all the while saying, oh, we didn't mean to, we didn't mean to. Occasionally they go to court, they get a fine. It was a cost of doing business for them, and they successfully degraded service in a lot of cases for ISP, you know, for small ISPs, put them out of business. Customers said, well, I better go with Verizon, I better go with SBC. There seems to have been a very successful precedent in terms of business of degrading service of new entrants. And that's the reason I would argue, I would, I would question, uh, Mr. Brenner, I would question, is that the reason you guys don't want to go for a rule? Because it gives you the opportunity to degrade where you please and to be able to have some kind of deniability. Uh, no, uh, not at all. F f you, you know, the audience should realize, not have to realize, but the fact is, is that some of, m some of the cable companies that are members of the, of, of, of the association I represent are, in fact, affiliates of Vonage. They sell the Vonage product as their VOIP product. So it's, it's not that the cable industry generally, uh, you know, ha has a, has a uh, unalterable opposition to Vonage, and Vonage has made overtures, I think, over the several months to increase the relationship between cable and uh, and, and that company. Uh, so w I don't think that whatever regulatory history may be true of the ILEX in the instance you're talking about, uh, there's, there's no evidence of that in this instance. What, what, our, what our engineers do tell us, though, is that, is that while we, would, we have no interest in slowing down or degrading products, there may be instances, and I can think of gaming applications being the n number one because, because the, the success of gaming uh, I'm not a, an internet gamer, but I understand that those who play games on the internet, and there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans who do, need a great speed uh, to get that done, and the faster the better, uh, that there may be instances where that kind of product might be offered to um, 
uh, an Xbox or a PlayStation uh, entity uh, to speed up those data rates or, da or data bits for those customers because the speed is of such essence. When I'm surfing the Internet, broadband is so fantastic, I don't need a speed up. I, it's certainly fast enough, and certainly for products like voice, uh, there's no issue at all in terms of speed. So degrading voice is like, it's just, it, it's like a, the two don't m match up. The question is, would you want to have, would you want to allow a cable company to offer a, a speed up service for gamers? I think that's probably in the public's interest to be able to do it. A general non-discrimination a la Tim Wu would probably make that a matter of multi-year litigation at the commission and the courts. Mr. Add, Citron? I just want to add one point. Um, you do have a right. I, mean, I, I want to be clear. Cable industry and Vonage do work very closely together <coughs> on most of these issues. We have a great working relationship. Many cable operators have partnered where we actually sell our services through cable. We do a lot of joint promotional deals together. It, it is working. We see a lot more problems on the DSL side of the house. Right. But with that said, it doesn't mean that in the future things don't change for economic reasons, and we just want to be rest assured and be concerned about this, this problem. But your points on interconnection is really quite interesting because it is occurring right now. For example, today Vonage has asked for a direct interconnection to the E911 systems, particularly the components that not only provide for traditional CLEC access, but also the ones for mobile access to the Piali and the, the Pianis. And um, we've been de we were denied initially by three of the four Bell operating companies that have such interconnection access. Uh, one uh, ultimately gave us, after uh, some discussion, and now the other three finally come back to the table and actually talking about it, but only under an enormous market pressure, the threat of massive regulatory investigations, and quite frankly, the threat of, of conditions on mergers are bringing these partners to the table. Sometimes that third stool is necessary when it comes to moving tra traffic back and forth between, between networks, and it is a real concern. Right. Yeah. So can I go back to the original question? So this ultimately is all about market entry. The, the real question we're talking about here is ultimately market entry. And there is a long history, telecommunications, and industry in general, but telecommunications in particular, of incumbents naturally wanting to block the market entry by their competitors. And it makes some sense. Um, you, you know, it makes some sense. Why face more competition than you need to? Um, and so. My vision of what the government's most successful roles have been over the history of telecom is in providing clear rules that punish efforts to block market entry. That is, I think, government's most successful uh, and historical role, is just providing <coughs> simple rules that, that, that can be relied upon by market entrants who otherwise might be destroyed by their incumbents. And I don't care whether it's wireless or whether it's cable or, or D DSL or broadband. This is the history of telecommunications. Um, you know, and as this, you know, cable and Vonage are actually natural friends. You know, they're naturally friends in a certain way because, of course, uh, having Vonage on your network allows cable to compete as a broadband connection with DSL connections, which naturally come with voice. So, you know, these, these, they're, they're sort of natural friends. The question will come for cable is when there seems, starts to be a serious internet television service and how interested they will be in allowing people to, uh, if they you know, not get any cable programming, TV programming, get all their, the, and have an internet television which they plug, instead of plugging a coaxial cable, just plug an ethernet cable into. That's when the serious questions will start to come for cable and network neutrality. So we're not really at that point right now. Yes, Brent Olson from SBC. You mean cell? You mean cell phones, right? Yeah. Sorry. All right. Okay. Yeah. Right. And uh, over time, the industries become more open. They've done deals with uh, Rain and other and other providers. Earthlink has done a number of deals with wireless providers. My question is, you know, is that? And then my, my question is, are consumers not getting what they what they want in that industry? And if they are, then I guess a rule wasn't necessary. And if they aren't, I'd like to know if you would apply this rule. To I can well, have an answer. Yeah. Sure. No, I mean, this is a starting point. I mean, I think wireless starts from a very different position for starters. I mean, when you, the wireless industry was born, it was born out of hundreds of wireless operators, not the uh, five or six that we have really today. And so the market developed in a very different, a very different um, fashion. Um, and in doing so, uh, created lots of different opportunities. But there are some non-discriminatory principles with inside 
um, wireless networks. I mean, and of course, wireless was granted lots of interconnection had interconnection rights and interconnection obligations to carry phone calls, and in doing so, um, allowed for the basis of service to to begin. What's quite interesting today now is, is one might have to look back at the wireless industry as it stands today and say, well, was that really good in the end? Because right now, the ability for me to choose providers is becoming increasingly limited. Um, the differentiation in services is, is dissipating quickly, and the ability for new entrants to come to the market is virtually non-existent. Today, uh, there's no ability for a new player to really come to market unless they go through a resale arrangement, and uh, in a resale arrangement, uh, quite frankly, many of, the, many of the wireless carriers that are owned by our box simply just do not enter into those kind of arrangements. Um, and that uh, could uh, could limit future competition in the marketplace. Right. Yeah, let me answer that question. So I agree, first of all, that wireless was built on the back of several important non-discrimination rules, some of which which came later, like number, number portability. Um, the other point I want to say, and this is a general answer to the QoS questions and, uh, and, other th and, uh, and also the, the, these uh, questions, is that a non-discrimination rule does not mean that all discrimination is illegal. It means that discrimination has to be justified. You see what I'm saying? So in other words, I mean, this is true in, in discrimination laws across the country. It means that the question is, there's a difference between legitimate and illegitimate discrimination. So if we look at employment, for example, if you uh, are hiring someone to be for a, a um, I'm trying to think of a you know, if you're, you're allowed to discriminate employment on the basis of ability, for example. You're allowed to discriminate when you're hiring a lawyer on the fact that they went to law school. You're just not allowed to discriminate on invidious basises or an attempt to destroy your competitors or things like that. So when I say a non-discrimination rule, it doesn't mean there's any room for legitimate discrimination. And some of these QoS examples, and I think some of the, the, the stories of wireless, you know, wireless only giving you access to like, certain services are instances of, uh, could be instances of legitimate discrimination. Nonetheless, I still think there's a way to go, and I think the cell phone market could, or the wireless market could be better. Um, for one thing, you know, it's, there's a lot of ways uh, I, I think arguably inefficient ways in which, uh, <coughs> for example, it's hard to take your phone from one network to another. Sometimes, you know, the service, the one, maybe one of the reasons that, you know, the, the wireless internet's never taken off is because it doesn't have a non-discrimination principle. You often end up with a bunch of services and not access to the whole internet and so on and, you know, the, these, kind of, these kind of problems. So it, it's a full answer. It's a little more complicated. But the, the better basic answer is there's been a lot of non-discrimination principles in wireless and it, it could be better. Dan? Dan. I just, again, I, this may be the long view of communications policy, but uh, listening to, to Tim, I was reminded of the debate we had 20 years ago or 25 years ago about the fairness doctrine. Uh, <laughs> the fairness doctrine was a great idea. It was that, 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 that controversial issues should be covered and that, were, and, that, and that news organizations should cover them in a balanced way so that all points of view. These are ideals that every journalist, I think, who holds himself out as, uh, uh, you know, not an advocacy journalist would say is what journalism is about. The reason I came to oppose the fairness doctrine was not that those principles, is what I saw in action at the FCC when I was there in the years before, which meant that when NBC tried hard to do a documentary, uh, industry came down on NBC's head and it cost a million dollars for NBC eventually to defend itself, ultimately upheld by the DC circuit, but it had to go through all that effort. Can you imagine in today's world of 527s and uh, the, uh, fraction, frac uh, the, 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 the fractious political environment we live in, how easy it would be for a broadcaster to defend itself against any claim. That takes me directly to the non-discrimination principle in, in, in uh, telecommunications with respect to the Internet. If, if the last nine years of the implementation of the Act have to taught us anything, it's that we are in a telecommunications litigation society and that, that it is very inexpensive uh, for business to litigate questions, tie things up in court, it's, it's much cheaper than having to do the gutsy thing of actually innovate and bring new products in. And that has spawned a whole telecommunications bar, but it also means that the process itself is very, it's very difficult to unwind that process from innovation. So the less that process can taint innovation, the more that the citrons of the world can go forward with new products without getting tied up in, 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 in litigation, the better. And I would say that's true not only for the application providers or the Vonages of the world or however their regulatory classification ends up being, but it's also true for the network providers, particularly cable, which did do this based on uh, risk investment in creating residential broadband. We have time for one more quick question. Uh, now, yes, Heather Weaver from RCR Wireless News. Hi. <laughs> 
case that I think is out there um, dealing with Clearwire. Um, can you kind of tell us a little bit about that case? And then um, also sit, um, whether the, if the two uh, law professors would tell us whether or not they think that because um, this is a wireless situation, whether we're now into a totally different title of the act and what, what that might mean. Sure. Well, in terms of Clearwire, we're still obviously thoroughly investigating the matter and working through issues. But clearly, it's come to our attention that some of our users on the Clearwire system have found that their ports have been uh, blocked, meaning the ports that are used for SIP communications. We resolved this customer service problem in the same way we should do within Madison River by just simply moving the service to a different set of ports, and that uh, restored service to the end user. And of course, we've gone out and done the technical. Uh, analysis that suggests that this port blocking is going on. We've contacted Mass River over the issue with our with our customer, and, not Mass River. I'm sorry, Clearwire, and they've uh, confirmed that yes, indeed, they do. They block uh, Vonage's ports. Um, now, what do we do? <laughs> and so we've gone down and, and, and we're talking with regulators about this problem, and yet to have a prescribed solution. Clearly, Mass River sent a clear message, uh, but maybe not clear enough for Clearwire to uh, to understand. Uh, well, oh, the law professor is supposed to say, um, uh, yeah, no, well, this is a Title I question, right? And I've already made myself clear on Title I. Um, uh, uh, as I understand the, I mean, the Clearwire people are saying, you know, we're just too new to handle the traffic right now. I don't know whether that's true or not, but the, I think under Chairman Powell, the FCC did a pretty good job of saying, you know, new stuff, we're going to be real cautious about that for a while. And, 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 and that satisfies me. I mean, the answer to this, the answer to the wireless competition problem, and maybe the answer to all of this wireless competition problem is more facilities-based competition, in my view. So to those of you who are staffers here, you know, turn off the analog television and do it real soon, okay? <laughs> Get that spectrum out there. Um, I mean, frankly, and I've, I'm in print, I, I turn off all television um, <laughs> broadcasting, but, you know. No, I, I do want to say right there on the wireless stuff, just so people understand, that today, Voice over P uses about 64K worth of bandwidth through a typical conversation. Customer buys broadband. Broadband's a lot more than 64K. So I'm not sure how Clearwire uses the argument, well, we're kind of new, we don't know how to handle a 64K stream of audio or, or any other media. Now clearly I can tell you that's, not, that's obviously not the truth because we've restored the customer service by just moving it to yet another port. So that service, customer service is working fine, the network's doing really well, <coughs> network isn't being harmed, no red lights are going off, towers didn't melt down, things didn't get destroyed. Yet, of course, every single one of the times my customers come to Clearwire, their service won't work until they call me. I change a few things around in the settings, and all of a sudden, shwink, the service starts working again. No, no, this I can't be a good, a, a good environment. And imagine for me to do this with, imagine we do open up that spectrum. Let's talk about that. I'm in favor. I agree. That's I for another thousand, panel, Mr. Citron. Uh, I've got a thousand little tiny ISPs now offering wireless service. I go after each and every one and talk to them about how they have to go ahead and open up their network every single time. Or I've got to reconfigure my end users right. every single day to work with a thousand different networks, each blocking myself or keep right. attempting to block right. my services. Right. So All right, right. Tim, consumers. Dan, last comments. So uh, the second, the last law professor comment. Um, yeah, this, the, the, the fact that this is a confusing question goes back to my same point that we need a uniform rule for all broadband carriers, regardless of their type, wireless, power line, you know, going through telepathy. I don't care. They need to have the same, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't care. They need to have some kind of similar rule because it's, it's ridiculous that you have to deal with a different statutory kind of system for different things. As for facilities-based competition, there's a strange idea that there's some difference between having a network neutrality system and, you know, and, and encouraging facilities-based competition. Of course I like facilities. Everybody likes facilities-based competition. The question is, what's the default rule in the meantime? We can't have this idea that, well, because we like facilities-based competition, that's a code word for saying, in the meantime, <laughs> we do nothing about, about network discrimination. I mean, they're just different, they're just different points. And so, you know, I, look, no one here is going to say, let's, let's stop facilities-based competition for some reason. The question is, what is the rule in the meantime? On facilities providers. Well, before we close, I want to just um, also thank our Senate um, Internet Caucus co-chairs, Senator Conrad Burns and Senator Pat Leahy. Um, and I also want to thank everybody in the audience for staying here for an hour and a half. I know you all have very busy schedules. And I think this was, has been a, a fantastic panel. And I really urge you all to, if you have further questions, which I know you do, stay and ask them. Thank you.